some thank yous. Uh, I'm going to be talking about this more, but the last year has been an adventure. And even though I was the one with the crazy idea that God might be wanting something new, so many of you have been so important in having it come alive. Each week we show up and set up and sing and pray and play and talk and plan for service projects and put together kits or sandwiches. We share our lives with each other in different ways. So thank you. It's hard for me to, because I really could just name everybody in this room for contributing. I could, um, in different ways. Uh, thanks to everybody who comes from St. Mark's. The support there means so much. Thanks to everybody who's come in new and just jumped in and lent a hand. Um, thanks to Luke, our musician. I want to say a special thank you to Heather, because not only does she organize and get enthusiastic for just about all of our service projects, which are so vital to what we're about. But on top of that, she's my communications consultant and biggest fan and keeps me grounded. And she's here every week setting things up and getting ready for worship. So after a year, I figure I should say thank you at least once to Heather, who is not exactly behind the scenes, uh, but who does a lot, and maybe you don't always know what she's up to. Uh, so I have the wind beneath my wings on a CD up there. Um, <laughs> could, could someone go, all right, I don't, I don't. All right, let's, let's have a prayer. God, you've brought us this far by faith. Your love, your vision of a better world, lead us onward. Guide us in the new year to come. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I was thinking about what has meant to me that we've started this new congregation. And something happened the other day that I feel like echoes it in some ways. A few months ago, I ran into some folks we'd met because of 6-8 at a different function at an Ignite Baltimore event. And we were talking about homelessness and ways to combat it and to be helpful to people dealing with it. And Kate told me that she carries socks in her car to hand out to people asking for money on the roads. And someone she knew who had been homeless suggested it because apparently it's hard to get your socks clean when you're living on the street. So since that conversation, Heather enthusiastically and I with some nervousness, have been giving out socks to people at intersections. And my nervousness comes probably just from overthinking it. What if I come off as condescending? What if the person gets mad? What if they want money instead? So this week I had two pairs of socks in my car that had been sitting there for a while. And I'd been avoiding giving them away for this or that reason. And I was on my way to a meeting and came to a light as it was turning red. I was first in line and I saw a man asking for help and I just thought, okay, now. I got the socks, I rolled down the window, and I said, can you use some socks? And he was like, oh, God bless you, thank you so much. God bless you. And it took about three seconds, and then I rolled up the window, and um, the light turned, and I drove away. And then as I was driving away, I really I felt overcome with emotion by his gratitude, by how simple it is that you know you can just give somebody socks, and it makes a big difference. And then also, oh, it may be very sad and angry that we to remember, to recognize that some people just don't have a good way to keep their socks clean, which is ridiculous, right? It's just so, there's, it's such a small thing and such a big problem. And the thing is that if I hadn't been part of 6-8, I don't think that this thing would have happened. I wouldn't have met the people who gave me the idea, first off. And second, I wouldn't feel part of something, part of a community that was trying to live out God's call in a more real, a more direct way. You guys challenge me to be a better Christian. It's funny, too, that in some ways this experience on Tuesday feels like, in some ways, what the year has been like. I did a lot of talking and thinking and worrying, and then we all did, and then we took some risks for God. And I felt the beauty and the gratitude of it and also the sense that there is so much more to be done. So a little segue. The church, as I knew it growing up, had a lot going for it. A lot of resources, right? Uh, Broadway and Council Bluffs had full seats on Sunday and including us families with kids hanging out in the balcony. Uh, I wasn't counting when I was 10, but I'm guessing there were about 200 on Sunday as I'm remembering back. With lots of kids my age in the Sunday school, six or eight of us in my single grade, fourth grade classroom, right? Um, The church we went to when I was in middle school and high school ended up adding a new sanctuary when I was in college in the late 90s. My college church had a campus ministry and a separate youth group with different staff. And you probably don't want to hear about the church I went to in seminary. You really don't. 
Although it was pretty cool. I can talk about it later. And yet, it seems that I may have been inhabiting a kind of a rear set of outposts where the pews stay full and the youth groups are active because, my experiences notwithstanding, the mainline churches, Episcopal, Lutheran, Methodist, Presbyterian, and yes, UCC, had been seeing membership go down for the last 50 years, give or take a decade or two. And the thing is, when the church I was baptized in put on its big education wing in the 50s, it was a social expectation that everybody went to church. It was part of being a good citizen, a good person. But that's just not the way things are anymore. The church as an institution has taken a hit or two. It might or might not comfort you to know that the church is not the only institution undergoing changes. Now with the rise of the internet, social media, and changes in how we get information just generally, all kinds of institutions are going to the mat. News media, government, medicine, education, you name it. The word is change or die. A, friend, a professor at my seminary died about a month ago, and I found out about it from a friend on Facebook that day. Right? I didn't see the email from the school until just this week, weeks later. And I probably won't get a printed article as part of the school magazine until sometime in June for something that's fairly important news. And what does this say about my relationship with the seminary, that that's how I get the information? What does that say about authority and trust? And then extrapolate that out to all our relationships, right? All our institutions. And the times, as they say, are a change in. I think that's in the Bible. No, no, it's not. It's it's Bob Dylan. All right. Is this a bad thing? On the one hand, it's really hard to see churches closing and selling buildings and having less money and less energy available um, for good things like the national setting, the UCC. I know there are a lot, but I know on the other hand, there are a lot of folks who aren't fans of institutional religion. Um, it can be um, bureaucratic, you know, it can be stifling to the Holy Spirit. But institutions do make it possible to get some really good things done. So it is hard to watch change and loss in action. And at the same time, I don't believe that just because there is change and loss, that that means that God has abandoned us. In fact, this could be the very sign that God is at work. In our scripture reading for today, Jesus and three of his closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, go up a mountain to pray. We read about Jesus going up on a mountain to pray fairly often in the Gospels. But most of the time we don't hear what happens while he's praying. Uh, just that that's where he was, that's where he went, and now he's back. So we get to follow along with Peter and James and John and find out what it's really like to be on the holy mountain with Jesus in prayer. And we are not disappointed. Jesus gets up there and starts praying. He's praying for a while. And the three disciples start nodding off. They don't have quite Jesus' focus, I think. And while they're waiting around, maybe a little bored, Jesus starts to undergo a miraculous transformation. His skin changes, his hair changes, his clothes go from the regular old dusty tunic to a brilliant white robe. He looks like a different person, or at least someone who's had a really good day at the spa. Makeover! All right, so... So that's the first amazing thing that's happened. Jesus is revealed to be someone more glorious than the disciples had previously realized. They thought he was a regular person, but look at this. There's something very dreamlike about the next part. Like the disciples are watching as their eyes are about to close from sleep. If you wonder who God in the form of Jesus might pray to, the answer is the prophets Moses and Elijah from Israel's past. Moses and Elijah. They're having a conversation about Jesus' destiny, how he's going to accomplish his own death and resurrection. It's a heavy topic, and it's good to have some experienced advisors. You know. Then Peter, as usual, doesn't get it. Why don't we stay here? He blurts out right as they're about to leave. I can build some huts. It's like he missed the whole point of their conversation, of Jesus' mission, his mission to defeat death, to usher in a new world. Then there's a scary cloud, and suddenly Jesus is back in his regular clothes, and they go back down the mountain. And Peter, James, and John, not really knowing what to make of this, or maybe not wanting people to think they're crazy, doesn't tell, don't tell anybody about it. Or maybe it only makes sense to them in retrospect, after Jesus dies and comes to life. Like overhearing your parents' conversation as a kid, and only really understanding it years later as an adult. Or like when you watch the end of the movie, The Sixth Sense, 
which I will not reveal here, just in case anyone hasn't seen it. Okay. You're like, what? Okay. The traditional understanding of our story today is that Jesus reveals to the disciples his true glory. They're able to see who he truly is in those moments on the mountain. What I'd like to think about is Jesus' clothes. Why do you suppose it is that Jesus wears regular clothes when they go back down the mountain? Why not take a little shortcut to winning over the masses and just wear your pretty white robe, right? Jesus didn't come to us as an overwhelming, glorious figure. He doesn't do that. He doesn't come as one who commands our respect without winning our love. Jesus comes to us as a person in a particular time and place, constrained to a particular culture and even a particular way of dressing. Jesus still does that. He still comes to us in human form in the church. The people of God, whether we meet in an ancient stone building that has always been a church, or an ancient brick building that was a mill first and then a movie theater and then a theater theater, we meet Jesus through each other, and sometimes in spite of each other. But Jesus always manages to put on new clothes to speak to us. I think if we went up the mountain now to see Jesus in his pure form, he'd be the same Jesus those disciples saw. But we need him to put on new clothes to come down the mountain so we can understand him and live with him and follow him. The church is like that. It's like clothes for Jesus. And it seems like Jesus is putting on some new clothes. Clothes for a culture where authority rests more in the people we know than in the so-called experts. Clothes for a culture where participation and inclusion are at least as important as doing things expertly. Clothes for a culture where not only can everyone read and write, but a lot of us have cell phones and can make our way around the Windows office suite or have loud opinions about how great Apple is. Clothes for a culture that we don't even know yet, but that is coming with changes that only God knows about. And yet, while Jesus puts on new clothes for us to understand him, at the same time, he is still the same Jesus, loving us, saving us, teaching us, and challenging us to bring about a new world, God's vision for a just and kind and loving world. Jesus wears the clothes, but the clothes are not Jesus. I am so grateful for all of you here. Because doing something new is way hard, It takes flexibility, imagination, patience, and the willingness to fail and try something else, none of which is automatic or easy. But you've done it, we've done it, and it gives me great hope that we'll find ways to find Jesus where he's hanging out in his new clothes. My hope for 6-8, as we seek to follow Jesus, is that we can find ways to be a different kind of church. That we continue to be a church that can adapt to and converse with and make a difference in this new world in which many of us are already living. It's a big challenge, but Jesus is there now, and he just got a wardrobe makeover. Thanks be to God. Amen.